Dad, the only reason they pulled me over is because I was a black guy in a white neighborhood. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 darkest sitcom moments. Mother, I don't understand your hesitancy when they made it a law you were for it. Of course, I wasn't pregnant then. Were you guys worried about me or something? No. Good luck, everyone. For this list, we're going to be ranking the most memorable, infamous, or affecting moments, events, and plot twists from sitcoms that were more than a little dark. Can you remember a time when television became real for you? Let us know in the comments. Number 20. Howard's Mom Dies – The Big Bang Theory It's always sort of shocking when a sitcom so well known for laughs decides to try something different and develop some real pathos. It's my mom's furniture. It belongs in the house I grew up in next to that pile of TV guides and in plain view of what for a 10-year-old was a quality piece of string art. There's even more of an adjustment for such an irreverent show like The Big Bang Theory. But this episode where Howard's mom passes away possesses a deft emotional touch. The scene where the news is broken via a telephone call is played straight for the most part, allowing the gravity of the situation to sink in for the audience. My mom died. <clears throat> that was my aunt. Ma took a nap. She never woke up. Afterwards, the cast spends time talking about their own relationships with Howard's mom, and this allows for a well-earned but tastefully executed bit of levity to balance things out. To Mrs. Wallowitz, uh, loving mother to all of us. We'll miss you. Number 19. Quagmire's Sister – Family Guy If a moment of seriousness on the Big Bang Theory came as a surprise, then count us gobsmacked when this episode of Family Guy hit the airwaves. Screams of Silence, the story of Brenda Q, plays the horrific domestic situation of Quagmire's sister completely straight, to the point where Glenn, Peter, and the rest of their crew plot to kill the boyfriend. Quagmire, you're talking about murdering a guy. It doesn't matter what he's done, it's still murder. No, Joe, it does matter what he's done. Th these kinds of guys don't change. What's even more shocking is that they actually go through with it, basically leaving no stone unturned with how far this episode was willing to go for its emotional payoff. And while reception to the episode was mixed, to say the least, we have to admire the chances Family Guy took releasing an episode this daring. We found this note he left you. Dear Brenda, I have decided to leave you. I realize that you are too good for me, and you and our unborn child would be better off without me in the picture. Love, Jeff. Number 18. James Evans Sr. Dies. Good times. We regret to inform you that your husband, James Evans, was killed in an automobile. Oh my God. The patriarch of the Evans family, James, was a caring and hard-working man, and the rock that held his family together. While trying to secure work in his native state of Mississippi to help his family move there, James dies in a car accident, devastating the whole family and the audience. Especially hard to watch is when his death finally hits his wife, Florida. Although adopted daughter Penny's treatment by her biological mother was also quite brutal, the effect this moment had on the show at large gave this moment even greater impact. <laughs> Number 17. Dr. Cox's Breakdown – Scrubs Dr. Perry Cox acted as the cantankerous, reluctant mentor to Scrubs protagonist J.D. After a former patient of J.D.'s apparently overdoses in one episode, Cox tells him that he can't blame himself for patients dying if he wasn't responsible, as it's a slippery slope. Once you start blaming yourself for deaths that aren't your fault, my friend, that's a slippery slope that you can't come back from, and trust me, I've seen it ruin a hell of a lot of good doctors." However, Cox falls victim to a similar depression after lobbying to use the dead ex-patient's organs to save three of his own patients, and it's discovered she had rabies. This ultimately leads to all three dying, which hits Cox especially hard as he's bonded with one of them. Cox's ensuing, drunken depression is hard for viewers and the characters to watch. Number 16. Uncomfortable Uncle – Family Ties Arthur. <laughs> 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 
Family Ties is probably best remembered for providing a breakout role for Michael J. Fox as a young conservative Alex P. Keaton. But the sitcom also featured its fair share of dark episodes. He hugged me real tight. He's a warm person. And then he patted me on the behind. It doesn't mean anything. Ball players do it all the time. <laughs> I'd understand if I just hit a home run. Fans may remember Speed Trap, which dealt with Alex's dependence on chemicals to study for an important exam. I blew it. Speed is like that, Alex. It'll keep you up for a while, but when you crash, uh, you crash hard. But this first season moment is even more disturbing. Give Your Uncle Arthur a Kiss follows Mallory Keaton as a trusted family friend, they even call him Uncle Arthur, makes a pass at her when no one is looking. No hard feelings? No hard feelings. <laughs> <laughs> the episode tries to balance comedy with this ultra-dark material, and the combination makes it cringy viewing, especially by today's standards. Stephen Arthur trying to seduce our daughter! <laughs> We'll be right back. Number 15. Discrimination. Family Matters. There's just no other way to say it. A sitcom clip this old shouldn't still be this relevant. The way this episode of Family Matters dealt with the racial profiling of Eddie Winslow is as good as anything done today that references this horrible subject. Then I asked what the problem was, and one of them told me to shut up. Then he made me get out of the car and lie face down. Then he cuffed me. Much of the honor should be put on the shoulders of Reginald Vell Johnson, who perhaps delivers the finest performance in the series, as he confronts the cops who pulled over his son the night before. His monologue is delivered with passion, elocution, and barely restrained anger, with the audience reaction being so quiet that one could probably literally hear a pin drop. So what do you say? That you only harass black kids whose parents aren't cops? I didn't say that. You didn't have to say that. Because the point is that you two harassed my son because he's black. It proves that sitcoms can indeed deliver the drama when tasked to do so. Just a second, Evans. You know, I really don't know how that badge stays on because it's pinned to slime. Number 14, Mateo is taken, Superstore. This fourth season finale for Superstore hits on multiple levels. For starters, there's the underlying tension as the employees at Cloud9 are discussing their options for unionizing. Mm. We've got a masseuse, oh, and we've got Cloud9 Frisbees for the kids. And for those of you who want to join the union, we've got collective bargaining rights, higher wages, and job security. Then there's the corporate reaction, which includes calling ICE agents to take away undocumented immigrant workers such as Mateo. The scene where the crew is trying to help Mateo is fraught with real tension and stakes, the likes of which you just don't normally see in a sitcom. Finally, when the jig is up and Mateo is taken away, the last lingering shot of his co-workers and the emotional resonance of the soundtrack is enough to make your hair stand on end. You were shadow, and I left you in the shade. Number 13. Goodbye, John. Eight Simple Rules. Rory, will you please not keep your shoes on the stairs? Those are dads. Okay. John Ritter's large comedic presence on the sitcom Eight Simple Rules was one of the reasons the show was so well received during its initial run in 2002. However, when the iconic actor died from aortic dissection a year later, the show dealt with the grieving process head on with a pair of episodes both titled Goodbye. They'd say, well, what do you know about mommies and daddies? And we would say, they always come back. Unless they collapse in aisle three of a stupid grocery store. There are barely any laughs to be had, as Ritter's character is written out of the show, and his family is forced to confront life without him by their side. It's honestly difficult to watch even now, yet it's also a strong reminder of just how much Ritter affected those around him with his talent and presence. Whether it's a you're an idiot, what a geek, or an I hate you, and I love you isn't far behind. And it's the knowledge that my wife and kids love me that makes it safe for me to wear pajamas and black socks to the breakfast table. Number 12, The Decision, Maud. It should come as no surprise that this spin-off from Norman Lear's All in the Family reveled in the same sort of envelope-pushing social commentary as its predecessor. 
The decision as to whether or not B. Arthur's character Maud should continue her pregnancy was important enough that a two-part episode, Maud's Dilemma, was aired during the show's first season. You don't have to think that way anymore. It's legal now. You know she's right. It's legal in New York State. You better give that a thought. I have given it a thought. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. It debuted at a time when such discussions weren't exactly commonplace, and it also put into perspective Maud's age and social standing. I think it would be wrong to have a child at our age. Oh, so do I, Walter. Oh, Walter, so do I. This wasn't just a problem that came up with a certain demographic or age group, but rather a topic affecting everyone in different ways. For you, Maud, for me. In the privacy of our own lives, you're doing the right thing. Number 11. Hotel Incident, Brooklyn Nine-Nine It isn't all that often that a cop show comedy can properly balance procedural storylines with sight gags and jokes, but Brooklyn Nine-Nine isn't your average cop show. If anything, it's a throwback to the classic 70s series Barney Miller with regards to the weight it allows certain subjects. It doesn't matter whether it's racial profiling, assault, or Rosa's coming out to her parents. Brooklyn Nine-Nine always had it covered. Jake and I aren't dating, but guess what? Your worst fears are real. I'm not straight, I'm bisexual, and I don't care what you think about it. Screw this, I'm out of here. The episode with the active shooter is another example of this, as it shifts between Jake and Charles joking around before the gravity of the situation sinks in. Moreover, Jake recognizes Rosa's badge number immediately, reminding us that, first and foremost, these characters' lives can be on the line. What are they saying? Show me going in their badge number. They're telling dispatch that they're close by and they're responding. Diaz, 3118, show me going. Diaz? Rosa Diaz? That's her badge number. Rosa's there. Number 10. An impossible favor. The Golden Girls. I'd like to drink a toast. To Sophia whom I hope I can count on. The Golden Girls is known for its witty barbs, smart writing, and unique approach to discussing serious social issues, such as the episode addressing HIV. AIDS is not a bad person's disease, Rose. It is not God punishing people for their sins. You're right, Blanche. Well, you're damn straight I'm right. And then the episode Not Another Monday brings more emotional weight with the subplot of Rose, Blanche, and Dorothy babysitting, contrasting with the main story of Sophia's friends' agonizing decision-making. The episode is full of important musings on friendship, family, and the quality of life as we age. The depression and loneliness that can sometimes occur as we get older is natural, as is the tone of the conversation between Sophia and her friend as Sophia tries to talk her out of it. You live with friends and family, holidays and warmth. I hear the silence. Although it all ends up okay in the end, Not Another Monday still resonates today. Number 9. Sean's Dad Dies – Boy Meets World How's your dad? Well, the doctor says he might need bypass surgery. Sean Hunter had a rough childhood, in no small part due to his drunken, absentee father Chet. When Chet returns, Sean is resentful due to how much he feels like his dad has made his life worse, both through action and absence. After a heart attack hospitalizes Chet, he and Sean get a chance to work out their differences, and his father indicates he intends to stick around. Wasn't I good enough for you? No, Sean. Wasn't good enough for you. However, heartbreakingly, just as they reconcile, Chet suffers a second heart attack and dies. While there have been quite a few parental deaths in sitcoms, this is one of the more tragic ones. Dad? Dad! Number 8. Camp Counselor Confrontation, Mr. Belvedere. Well, maybe you'll be with me tomorrow. I think I'm gonna be in Miss Pritchard's group from now on. The 80s sitcom Mr. Belvedere may not be as well remembered as some others on this list, but fans who did watch all seem to remember this troubling episode from the series' fourth season, The Counselor. He might try to do something. Put his hands on him or something. Here, young Wesley Owens wonders what to do and who to tell when a camp counselor turns criminal during a moment when the pair are alone after a swim. Episodes of Mr. Belvedere usually ended with the title character writing in his diary, but the counselor instead featured a character-breaking moment addressing the audience about who to contact in the event of a real-life situation like this one. No one should ever touch you in a way that makes you feel bad. And if they do, tell someone you trust, like, 
Your mom or your dad? Number seven, The Bicycle Man, Different Strokes. What's the old saying? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Different Strokes is known for the amount of taboo topics covered during its eight-year run. Die-hard fans may remember the creepy vibe of The Hitchhikers, but every sitcom aficionado is familiar with The Bicycle Man, a two-part episode dealing with the worst of all topics. Why don't we just make it our little secret, huh? Arnold Jackson and his friend Dudley are lured, step by step, into the twisted world of their local bike shop owner, Mr. Horton. The young boys are given ice cream and comics at first, but then are shown adult cartoons and encouraged to take photos of themselves. It's profoundly creepy and horrible, yet delivered in a realistic and incredibly dark way. Don't say we didn't warn you. It's not your fault, son. Number six, drunk driving tragedy, growing pains. Carol, don't worry, I'm gonna be okay. My car, on the other hand, that's who you should worry about. This very special episode of Growing Pains is something of an ultra-tragic bait-and-switch. Second Chance dealt with the dangers of drunk driving when Carol's college-age boyfriend Sandy, played by future friend star Matthew Perry, is in a major car accident. Oh, to tell you the truth, I don't feel so hot. I got so many tubes and wires in me. I get HBO now. Sandy speaks to Carol at the hospital, and we're led to believe that he'll eventually pull through, only to be informed later that the young man dies from his injuries off screen. What is it, Mike? Carol, Sandy just died. Sandy never received his titular second chance, and we're forced to directly view Carol's grief as she embraces her family after receiving the news. Number five, Will's father, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. All of the episodes on this list are emotionally affecting, but this moment from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air may be one of the most well-acted. I'll call you next week and we'll iron out the details, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, yeah. It was great seeing you, son. You too. Lou. Will Smith was no stranger to strong performances on the show, such as the episodes dealing with guns or racial profiling. No map is going to save you, and neither is your glee club or your fancy Bel Air address, or who your daddy is. Because when you're driving in a nice car in a strange neighborhood, none of that matters. They only see one thing. This one particularly tugs on the heartstrings, however, when we find out Will's deadbeat father leaves him for the second time. Although Will was at first elated at the prospect of his dad coming back into his life, this happiness then turns to disappointment, anger, and profound grief as he lets out all of his emotions during an epic monologue. I learned how to drive, I learned how to shave, I learned how to fight without him. I had 14 great birthdays without him. He never even sent me a damn card. To hell with him! The final embrace with Uncle Phil makes this already tearful moment all the more poignant. Number four. Over the top, Blackadder. There's just something quietly brilliant yet tragically sad about the finale to this classic British comedy. Don't forget your stick, Lieutenant. Rather, huh? Wouldn't want to face a machine gun without this. It's World War I, and all attempts at stalling the inevitable have failed. It's time for the soldiers to go over the top, into the battlefield, and face what might be the end of their lives. We, the audience, realize that Rowan Atkinson and his comrades in all likelihood will not survive, and this is echoed by the slow motion sequence and quiet, moody musical accompaniment. <laughs> Although the jokes about a cunning plan are there right to the end, once the bullets are flying and bombs are bursting, the smiles on our faces are immediately replaced with the emotion of somber understanding. Number three, the Ice Age, Dinosaurs. If you've ever watched Jim Henson's Dinosaurs to the very end, then you know exactly which episode is at this spot. Changing Nature is infamous for being one of the bleakest ends to a sitcom ever, particularly one that deals with anthropomorphic dinosaurs. As thick black clouds of sulfurous gas and soot now shroud the entire planet, blotting the sun from the sky and causing global temperatures to drop precipitously. It's one thing to learn in school about how the Ice Age destroyed the dinosaurs, but it's another altogether seeing characters we've come to know and love being buried by falling snow. What's even more depressing, beyond Earl's involvement in the end of things, is the quiet acceptance of the dinosaurs' fate. They just hope beyond hope that everything will be okay, even though we know it won't. After all, dinosaurs have been on this earth for 150 million years, and it's not like we're going to just 
disappear. Number two, the horrors of war, MASH. There's something wrong with it. It stopped making noise. It just, <laughs> just stopped. The final episode of MASH was a television landmark full of dark and memorable moments, but this one remains shocking to this day. Hawkeye Pierce is forced to recall a traumatic event while being held in a psychiatric hospital, one which occurred while Pierce and a group of wounded refugees were hiding in a bus from enemy fire. He tearfully processes a moment where he angrily yelled at a woman to quiet her crying baby, only to react in shocked horror when the woman actually smothers the child. She, she killed it. She killed it. Hawkeye's tears, anger, and frustration are palpable as the audience is taken through his stages of grief, resulting in an utterly heart-wrenching scene. I didn't mean for him to kill it. <laughs> I, I just wanted it to be quiet. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Edith, all in the family. Oh. So I'd like to ask you and, and your husband a couple questions, if I could. Oh, sure, but my husband ain't here. Norman Lear's All in the Family and its spiritual sequel, Archie Bunker's Place, were pioneering dramedies, tackling difficult issues like miscarriage and death at a relatively early point in television history. The All in the Family episode, Edith's 50th birthday, was one of the first sitcom episodes to deal with a subject as strong as assault, as Edith Bunker is confronted at gunpoint by a criminal who makes his way into the Bunker house disguised as a policeman. The audience reacts with nervous laughter as Edith panics and attempts to talk her way out of the situation with some jokes. Wouldn't you like a cup of coffee? <laughs> this makes the scene even more difficult to watch as it switches back and forth between awkward humor and brutal realism. He tried to. He tried? What, what, what happened? What did he do? It was, it was awful. Don't you see it? It was awful. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.